Well, it is time once again for another episode of Notes from the Turning Shop. This is April 2020, and I want to start out by mentioning those people that are still working and serving us, those essential workers out in uh, the workforce who are taking a chance with the coronavirus. We're right in the middle of this thing. It's easy for me. I'm usually locked down in my shop anyway, so I'm not making any major changes or sacrifices. Thank you, people. Uh, you know, my heart goes out to you. You're in a dangerous position sometimes. And, uh, you know, anyway, let's move on with some comments. The last couple videos I've done. Um, Amy Baumgart mentioned that she was on one of my videos and I had talked about buffing. And I use this Menzerna product right here. And it's on the Stuart McDonald website. Well, they no longer carry that, they carry color tone. So if you accidentally stumble upon that or you need some buffing compound, uh, color tone is what the Stuart McDonald website carries. And I'll put a link up to that. So thank you, Amy, for that comment. Turning an end grain honey locust pot. This is an old video. And the person that got on there basically said, uh, I was wasting material in his comment. I'm not going to mention the names of some of these people because I don't think they want to be singled out or embarrassed. It's not my, my point to embarrass anybody. Um, it's like you all waste so much material. Well, I was turning a little, little pot and I love wood. I love resources that the earth provides without being too much of an old hippie, you know? Uh, anyway, I, I'm not wasting stuff. Here's one, here's one point I would make. Whatever you're making, and I got a, a couple, this is an old uh, apple mallet that I made in one of my videos. If I have a piece of wood, no matter how big it is, I'm not gonna let the size of that piece of wood dictate the final shape or size of my piece, okay? I may cut off a little bit, I may turn a little bit more that might go into shavings on the floor. But anyway, um, Ralph Pickering, next comment. I'd love to see a video on how you get the model finish on this particular piece. And, and what I was using was the uh, Verde metal reactive paint. And I think maybe what he was referring to was there were a lot of different colors in this and, and maybe the, the finish was rather uh, non-gloss. It was a very satin and what I use is something like an artist fixative and it just doesn't have any shine to it at all. But uh, that's kind of a complicated issue, but I, I need to do something more with the metal reactive paint because that is so much fun to, uh, to work with. Thank you, Ralph, for watching one of my old videos. Uh, Sasha, I, I think I heard from that viewer the last time I did notes. Anyway, did you make it to Alaska with all the new travel restrictions and et cetera? No, I did not make it to Alaska. And one of my fears, and I'm a, I'm a worry wart from the word go, was get up to Alaska and get quarantined or you can't get a flight back. Anyway, no, didn't make it to Alaska. That was kind of sad. Uh, I had sent some wood up there to a gentle, gentleman named Tom, and Tom sent my wood back, and it was very sad to unbox that because I had all kinds of plans for turning that wood in either a demonstration or hands-on classes. So anyway, sorry about that. We didn't make it up there. All right, this next comment deals with sanding. And this is maybe a well-kept secret. I don't think the, uh, the sandpaper industrial complex is gonna advertise this fact too much, but he mentions or asked um, about sanding rosin to clean sandpaper, like a two-inch sanding disc or something like that. And yes, I have these all over my shop. And, and I think you might find them under like a, a crepe uh, it's like a the bottom of a tennis shoe, you know, and you can just uh, rub that along 
your sandpaper. This is one I use uh, to clean my sanding belt of my sanding center. This will make your sandpaper last a whole lot longer. That's a small investment and you'll get a lot of returns from that. C. Zellner, his comment, and I'm not sure if he really asks anything. He says, be safe and healthy. Charlie, Charlie Zellner, he says, from one old hippie to another, groovy man. Yeah, right on with that. Yeah, all right. Um, now here's another viewer that I'm not going to mention. Uh, basically showed a video or put a link to a video up where somebody was using a spindle roughing gouge on a bowl. No, you just, you don't want to do that. It's really dangerous. Let me find one and I'll... All right, here we go. Here's a spindle roughing gouge. Let me hold that up in this camera so you can kind of see it. You know what a spindle roughing gouge is. It's got a tang here that's very weak. And I've been through this many times on videos. This can break right here. If you get a catch, and I can't explain, you know, geometrically. Uh, <laughs> I'm not an engineer. This uh, particular shape and the size of it is very prone to a catch, especially in end grain. So you don't want to use this. And I know some of you wood turners are fairly new out there. And this is the number one thing I, I talk to people about when they come and do a class. I hammer in over and over spindle rough and gouge for spindles, for end grain turnings that run parallel with your bedways. Not for cross grain work. Anyway, let's move on. Sorry, got on my soapbox here for just one second here. Uh, but that's a good thing to uh, understand, you know, safety. All right, Blake, I love the whiteboard drawing. Oh, I appreciate that. I do that off camera and I spend hours on my drawings. Are you able to do the same uh, to show the shape and connection points for a jam chuck? when you're turning a sphere. Now this particular video, which you might find out there, I was turning a sphere and I, and I used a jam chuck to finish it off. Um, one, one thing you might do when you're doing this kind of a jam chuck for a sphere is um, the jam chuck might be from a, a fairly, you know, slightly wet wood. If it's really dry, it's not going to maybe grab onto that sphere as well. So that's a good good thing you might do, but you just have to practice. You know, that's, that's kind of what it amounts to a lot of times. Practice, practice, practice. Um, Dennis Goynier, I appreciate your tool introduction reviews. Ordered a robust ER32 handle insert kit. Okay, and, and I am using more of the insert collet uh, tool handles as of late. Um, I've got a couple from uh, Robust Tools. Okay, and I've got uh, three, I think, from the Stuart Batty line of handles. Uh, both fine products. Uh, Stuart Batty carries a lot of really, really good tools, and you can find the Stuart Batty uh, line of tools at uh, Woodworkers Emporium in Las Vegas. And I always visit there when I'm in Las Vegas. That's my first stop. Literally. Uh, Kevin Coop. Sam, I am hoping that you are a far distance from the Yellowstone in Montana, the Yellowstone Park. I think he's referring to it a couple weeks ago. We had um, an earthquake a little bit farther west in Montana. Uh, we didn't feel it here, but uh, you know, that whole Yellowstone Park caldera thing, and that means there's a volcano under there. And if it blows up, eh, we probably won't know it if you get my drift. Um, oh, I like this. Bobby Fowler. Uh, what's the difference in colors on your tool handles? Good question, okay? So, I've got spindle roughing gouges, or a lighter green. And let me just show you 
this particular list here. Uh, spindle gouges, yellow, bowl gouges, red. I'm reading this backwards through this paper, so forgive me if I mess it up. Parting tools, a particular color. And the reason I did this is whenever I have somebody come into my shop to do a class, uh, some people have a hard time distinguishing between a bowl gouge and a spindle gouge. Well, uh, I do sometimes too. I've got to look at the flute and, you know, if, if one is uh, yellow and the other one is another color, you can tell the difference. And I've got these hung up in a couple different places in my shop. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Uh, Phil. Above or below center line, inside and out. On my video dealing with a scraper, controlling a scraper, I talked about, you know, where you hold that tool, this is not a scraper, where you hold that tool if you're on the inside of a bowl and on the outside of a bowl. And he just simply said, thanks for explaining that now. Oh, he says, I would ask if you could go over how to turn a traditional round scraper into a negative rake scraper. Well, let me find one and I'll... Okay, let's see here. All right, now, the question is concerning turning a regular conventional scraper into a negative rake scraper. Let me move some of this garbage out of the way here. Yeah. And yes, there are notes. Actual notes. All right, where am I at here? <laughs> now I got one, my one camera close in a little bit so I can show you uh, a traditional scraper right there. And this is one of my bigger scrapers. Uh, it's probably three eighths of an inch in cross section here, a nice hefty scraper. How to turn a traditional scraper into a negative rake scraper. Okay, if I sharpen this on my sharpening wheel, platform is here and the wheel's coming down. All you do is just turn that tool over, sharpen another bevel right here on this tool. On this top bevel, it's up to you what the angle is and how far you want that bevel to come back. But it's not hard to do. You just do that on the, on the platform on your one-way system or whatever you got. All right. But that's a good question. And it's not hard to do. And sometimes if I'm not using a particular tool very much, it could be a skew chisel. It could be an old scraper or parting tool. I repurpose it and grind it into something else. All right. Randy Jones has a really, really good quest. Randy Jones has a really good question. <clears throat> Tips on scrapers. Just to make sure I understand correctly, the being above center line, inside and below, etc. Uh, is it the cutting edge or the tool rest? Okay. Uh, ordinarily, when a wood turner on a video or something explains that or refers to that. It's the cutting edge. You, you want the cutting edge above center line or you want the cutting edge below center line. So that's kind of where we're at there. Do you ever use a burnishing tool to raise a burr from Kenneth Nuttall? Great question. Now, uh, ordinarily when we sharpen a scraper right there, um, when we sharpen it, the wheel's coming down right here and it raises a burr on the top of the tool. Now, I don't know if Kenneth is maybe an old woodworker. Let me find something that I would use to burnish that. All right, here we go. All right. Now, what I have here, this is just a, a little Tommy bar for taking a chuck out or tightening something that's on your spindle on your headstock. Now, to burnish this with this kind of a tool, you just take this and run it along the cutting edge right here, and you can raise a burr. A little bit difficult to do, but they actually make 
these kind of burnishers. This may not be hard enough steel. It's got to be pretty hard steel to do that, but that's how you would raise a burr. And in answer to uh, Kenneth's question, yeah, I do that once in a while. You know, I it, maybe if I don't want to go back to the grinder, I just pick something up and I and I can you know really really put a a, a pretty good burr on a tool just by burnishing it. And to define that, burnishing just means what I just explained. You're taking that uh, piece of steel right here and you're running along the cutting edge from the underside. That's an old woodworking tool, like a cabinet scraper uh, or a hand scraper. Okay, Wolf from Australia, down under. Now we're supposed to get into warmer weather and I always tease these guys, you just made it through your summer and now it's your turn to get cold. Sorry about that Wolf, but uh, if you could see outside right now, it's snowing, so I don't know. Um, I've noticed that you do not use a specialty curved bowl rest. Um, any particular reason? Well, you know, years ago I used to have an inside curved rest and an outside curved rest, and I didn't like them. I just, I don't know, there's something about um, the, the the support they offer to a tool. Um, okay, I had to find a, a tool rest. All right, so I'll put this tool rest up here. And if I'm turning, I want my tool fairly perpendicular to the tool rest, okay? When I get out like this, I'll try to show it in that one camera. I get out like this, it offers less support, okay? And I found that with a curved tool rest, I was okay maybe to where I was starting, but as I moved around the corner, I wasn't getting the same angle into the tool rest. I gave those away. I, I just, you know, sometimes something doesn't work and I'm sure they're fine and maybe if I tried them again, I'd, I'd like them, but I, I don't know. Um, a lot of times it simply comes down to the way you learn something in the first place is the way you do it now. All right, and that's maybe not necessarily good or, or bad. Uh, where am I at here? Wolf, okay, thank you, Wolf. Uh, stay safe down there, uh, down under, and the rest of you all over the world maybe. These are challenging times. Oh, John Replinger, and actually um, there was another comment about this, and I can't remember who did that or who asked that <clears throat> question, but boy, John Replinger has good eyes. And in one of my videos, this was on possibly the negative rake scraper. Let me, let me put this in, in view here like this. He looked at that. And he really understood that my angle right here, right here, was not 135 degrees. And he could tell by looking at that. And he was spot on. He said, uh, I'm pretty certain that the angle on top of your negative brake scraper is 165 degrees, not 135 degrees. John, you were absolutely right. I measured that again and it was, just dead on to 165. All right, I like it. That's okay. <clears throat> All right, we are getting down to the last question here. And Joe Himes. Sam, I'm a little confused. Well, I'm a lot confused ordinarily, so I'll, I'll try to add to that confusion. Okay, I'm going to paraphrase this. And I think he was asking about this particular tool right here. Okay, my favorite Boxmaster negative rake scraper. And I've got a different grind on each end. Okay, so this might be for the outside of a project. And if I flip it, this might be for the inside of a box or something. Now, I think what his question was, I was probably turning, well, let's say, I was turning with this edge, 
Okay, and there's a burr on the top of that. You need to have a burr on this or it doesn't cut very well. And I think what I did, <clears throat> I turned this over, which meant the burr was on the bottom side. But once in a while, I'm just in a position where I can just do a little bit of cutting or scraping by flipping that tool over. It doesn't do a very good job, but it's just the position I'm in. And I think that's what, and I think that's what Joe was talking about. He says, you took the tool on the acrylic, I was turning the cast resin apparently, and flipped it and then went back to turning. Did you have a burr on both sides? Well, you, you really can't have a burr on both sides. But anyway, I think that, that's what he was talking about. Um, I've been trying to teach my wife how to turn and she's done very well. It's a very complicated issue. A very complicated skill, I should say. Not easy. It's very complicated. I mean, there's sanding and turning and scrapers and, and cutting and sandpaper and finishing. Anyway, um, if, you, if you have a question, contact me. And I'm not afraid to have people call me. I have people calling once in a while. It's always fun to talk to somebody in a foreign country, you know, or... Nebraska. Oh, I'm going to get mail from Nebraska. Just kidding. Anyway, thank you very much for tuning in. Please like my videos, share them, leave a comment. I appreciate it. Uh, we're all kind of stuck inside our homes or our shops, unless it's some of those workers I mentioned out there doing their jobs, serving us. I appreciate that. I'll talk to you next time. Thank you. This is Sam in a very cold and chilly Montana. <laughs>